morning, New Circle Church. Welcome. It's so good to see you all on this Labor Day weekend. For those who are not traveling and just um, hopefully you're getting some rest this weekend, some time to relax, enjoying this beautiful weather that we're alive. It's changing seasons um, from spring to from summer to fall. What a beautiful uh, change in the air. And um, so this morning I, I have a painting. It's an e- it's the Ethiopian painting. Andrew, do we have that? No, that's not it. No. morning, guys, so be patient with us and gracious. I have it here, obviously nobody can see it, but anyway, it's it's an Ethiopian painting, and I, and, and I was just drawn to some just, just works of art this week that extend outside of our normal concept of, of, of Christ and what, you know, in the world cultures, and I was drawn to this painting, um, just these eyes that are looking upon Christ with his arms out extended, he's welcoming, welcoming these people to him, they're weary, they're burdened, they're carrying heavy anxieties, and their eyes are upon the Lord, and he's saying, I can take it, I can handle it, come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I'm going to read this call to worship to you. If any of you want to walk my path, you're going to have to deny yourself. You'll have to take up your cross every day and follow me. If you try to avoid danger and risk, then you'll lose everything. If you let go of your life and risk all for my sake, then your life will be rescued, healed, made whole and full. And as we come to the church this morning, we look around, we see uh, these people, each so precious, each so unique, little ones, older ones, busy ones, tired ones, each come to be part of something bigger than just me. May this community draw us into you, loving God. As we come to church this morning, we look inward. We close our eyes. We rest a moment. We breathe in and out. You, O oh God, are within us, beneath us, above us, and around in the motes of the dust that float in the air and the stillness that rests under all the noise that surrounds. In this place, In every place, Lord, you are drawing us to you, loving God. Let's pray together, friends, before we worship. Father, thank you so much for an opportunity to gather this morning, this call to worship, what it means to be called into the sanctuary. For those who are watching online, for those who are standing outside, for those in the cafeteria, for those in this place, in this sanctuary, may we find sanctuary and rest in you, most high and Holy God, that is who you are. You are the name above every name. We offer our praise, our worship to you, knowing that you are ready to meet. You are in everything, Father. As we look upon our brothers and sisters, the little ones, the older ones, the tired ones, the ones who come with anxieties, physical tiredness, spiritual tiredness, physical pain. You are a God of all. And may we praise you today with our masks on. May we just sing loudly, sing your praise. You are not surprised by anything. You are here with us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Who am I that you are my 
mindful of me that you hear me when I call. downtrodden and, and depressed about the sin that we carry, the anxieties and the worries, but it's an opportunity for us 
to say, Lord, I confess this is on my heart. This has been reoccupying my thoughts, my mind, and my attention. Lord, I submit that to you. So we have this painting. It's an Eastern European abstract painting. And I just, I'm kind of drawn to the chaos of it. You can see the cross within it, but so much of us is a little like this abstract painting. The cross is in there. And there's a lot going around, a lot of color, a lot of sorrow, a lot of, a lot of pain. We're all in need of healing. We're all in need of Jesus. So let me pray for us. Father, we come not as those who are strong in faith, but those whose faith is feeble weakened because we have trusted in ourselves, in our own abilities, in our own strength, in our own intellect, instead of trusting in you. We have awakened from our beds this morning, and we have partaken in meals and moved our limbs, and we used our senses to thankless hearts, ignoring you, the sovereign Lord, over every detail of our lives. We confess that we have thought you to be a little God and the people of the land to be like giants. We have feared men rather than God. Father, we admit we have too often set our affections on things of this world. We have prized possessions and praised people. We've been captivated by books and entertainment by our screens. We have thought of you, the God of the universe, who gives life to the dead, who calls us into existence things that do existence, things that do not exist. We've called that to be boring. We have refused to come to Christ to be healed. Lord, our souls thirst for you, but we have refused to come to Christ, the fountain of living water, that we might drink and be satisfied. Lord, we admit that we have failed to trust your testimony about yourself, that you are good, and all that you do is good. Lord, we confess that we have not followed the way of our master. We have not imagined Jesus' love and care for the sick. We have shut up our hearts and stayed away from those we have thought to be unclean. Forgive us of our false worship as if mere words and mere works could please you instead of worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Forgive us for trying to dress up our grumbling and gossiping and discontentment into prayer requests, as if you don't search the heart and know the motives and intentions of it. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, if you would tally up the number of things we've preferred over you, if you would count the number of prideful thoughts lustful thoughts, bitter thoughts, or envious thoughts that we have accumulated in our hearts. If you would open the record and judge us for every empty and idle word we have spoken, Lord, who could stand? But with you, friends, with you, Lord, there is forgiveness through Christ Jesus, who pierced us, who was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and by his will. In his name we pray. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be.
Japanese painting by a man named James Huchi. It's called Peace. Be still. Do you remember our painting in Ethiopia where he began with Jesus' arms outstretched? And here Jesus is on the waves, the storm of the sea. What are you drawn to in this painting? Where do your eyes go first? Don't worry us about the about Jesus' resolute stance for the disciples working toward him. What does this painting say about Jesus Christ? On that day, when evening had come, he told them, let's cross to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. And he was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. Imagine that. So they woke him up. They said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, silence, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Lord, how, de how desperately we need to hear. Be still, my child. Be still, my son and daughter such assurance in your voice. There's such assurance in your presence. You are with us in the storms of our lives. And too often we forget that. Praise your name, Father. Thank you for the beauty of your assurance. You love us so much, so tenderly. And we just rest in you. I drink from oh. 
scripture today will be coming from John 15 verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. 
If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you guys can have a seat. Well, I've just made an executive decision that every bit of scripture reading today is going to be done by Demetrius. Man, I almost came up and read that. And I'm, you just, you go ahead, brother. You just, just read your heart out. So I, I, we had a big wedding here last night. Christopher preached, and his ear's not perfect like mine, so I'm having to readjust this thing some. But Jesus was an amazing man, a really amazing man. The ways that he did things, the ways that he operated, that Jesus Christ was literally the Son of God from eternity past in heaven with God and the Spirit. And then he left heaven and came to earth and Hebrews says that he, he made himself lower than the angels. And when he spoke with people who knew a lot, he spoke as one who knew a lot. When he spoke with common folks, he spoke to them as people would speak with common folks. When he spoke with children, he spoke to them with tenderness and care. When he spoke to the sick and the afflicted, he spoke to them in a way that spoke to their hearts. You see, even though he was greater, he considered himself less. And Jesus often spoke in parables. Stories that were kind of confusing, but he did this for the Holy Spirit to provide guidance and understanding. And even when he did this, he spoke in ways and in terms and phrases that would speak to the hearts of the people of his day. This is kind of what we see Jesus doing in this passage. It's the setting for his ministry was in a very agrarian society. So they're primarily farmers and workers of the land. So when Jesus spoke, he used a lot of agricultural references. That's why there's so much farming stuff talked about in the Bible. Now, if Jesus was in Indianapolis, there were and, and like the Bible was written in that time, there have probably been references to the cults, you know, like the godly cults and the evil patriots. You know, like there may be some, some dichotomies like that. And if you're a Patriots fan, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. I'm trying to make my son happy by, by letting him hear this. But, but there would be different illustrations. You'd have illustrations of the city. You would have illustrations that would uh, correlate with sports or business or other things that Indianapolis as a city reveres. So my goal for today is to help us understand this story the way that people back then would have understood this story. So whether we're here, outside, Zoom, cafeteria, Facebook, like I want us to be able to, to see this and feel this and understand this as the people that Jesus was speaking to understood it, to break it down in terms for us and understand that this story, as we focused on spiritual maturation this entire year, this story holds within it all of the pieces and the roles of spiritual maturation. Spiritual maturation must be energized, freed, and guided by the Trinity. So spiritual maturation, our growth, as spiritual beings must be energized, freed, and guided by the Trinity. In this passage, we'll see that Jesus Christ is the vine. It says, God the Father is the gardener. God the Holy Spirit is like a trellis that those, those branches grow on. And that believers, we are the branches. And if you are not yet a believer, you are invited today to become one of the branches. To become a fruitful part of the body of Christ. We go further, let's pray again. God, thank you so much for the words that we've been able to sing today. God, give us understanding and clarity as we read the words of your son. Look at other words from your, your holy, holy word. God, be with us and bless us and speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus begins in John 15. He says, I am the vine. This means that Jesus is the vine. He is good. He's strong. He's healthy. He has deep roots. Like he is sufficient. He provides a strong basis and a strong attachment.
for all who are connected to him and provides all the nourishment that they need. You see, if any branch grows, it's because they're connected to the vine. In this illustration, Jesus says that he is the vine and that believers are the branches. So God, the son, provides the energy for spiritual growth. Jesus said, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. You see, a branch can't grow and fruit can't be born from a branch unless it is well connected to the vine because the vine provides the nourishment. It provides all the minerals and everything needed from the root and from the soil in order to grow. Last night I said there was a beautiful wedding here, or at least some of the flower remnants are up here. And they had flowers, fresh flowers laid out on the tables last night. And when we sat down to start having the meal, they were all, by the time that meal was over, they'd started to wilt because they'd been disconnected from the vine. They'd been disconnected from their nourishment. You see, being connected to the vine is of great importance. And in this society, they would have heard this with a grander picture than what we may have of the vine. You see, these people were Jewish folks that Jesus was speaking to. And in the Old Testament, God frequently, frequently referred to Israel as the vine. He frequently referred to the Jewish people as the vine. The prophet Isaiah said that God was the one who watched over the vine and watered the vine and made sure that no one disturbed it. And he's the one who cares for it so that it takes root and blossoms and that its fruit would fill the entire earth. But the problem was that Israel oftentimes sought to detach themselves from God. Whenever the gardener would come and trim the vine and he would prune the vine and he would work to help the vine become more fruitful, they, they pushed against God. And they said, we don't want your touch. We don't want your help. We don't want your guidance. And they sought to do their own thing. And so that vine was not the vine that God intended it to be. So while God was the perfect gardener, Israel was not the perfect vine. And so in love, God sent Jesus to be the perfect vine. He sent Jesus to be the true vine, the one whose fruit would truly fulfill, fulfill the earth, fulfilling the covenant that God had made to Abraham, saying that your, and your, your, the ones who come after you will fill the entire earth, that the whole earth would be blessed by them. So now, instead of being the vine, people are referred to as branches, and our invitation is to remain as a branch. Our invitation is to remain. In Scripture, we see that some branches fall away. We see that others are removed, and while others even are grafted in, as a master gardener would do. So we may ask the question, why would a branch not remain? I, I don't know. I'm not a, an, an agricultural scientist, but I do know when I'm cutting the grass in my yard, there's a lot of those little things that fall off, all right? And I hate running over them. And sometimes I judge them based on how thick they are, and I'll just run over them because it's better to just run over them than have the kids like throw them at each other or use them as swords. And so if they're small, I'll run over them. If they're sometimes moderate size, I'll still run over them and I decide if I've made the right decision or not based upon if the mower continues to run. All right, y'all know what I'm talking about. But sometimes branches fall away. You see, Jesus said that the only way that we can remain, the only way that we can grow the only way we can grow and bear fruit is to remain with him spiritually. And this goes against our very ideas of self-sufficiency. This goes against the idea of that we are who we are and we don't need anyone else besides us. Like if we're going to grow spiritually, we're going to grow spiritually. We're going to get in the word or we're going to take up some spiritual disciplines or some spiritual practices or we're going to go spend a week alone in the woods by ourselves and commune with God. None of those things are wrong, but we cannot do any of those things and provide spiritual growth devoid or cut off from the vine. We can't produce spiritual growth ourselves. It is only by Christ that happens. You see, we are sinners who have turned from God, and we cannot be the vine ourselves. As a branch, we are called to stay connected to the vine. So in remaining attached to the vine, we are saying to God and to the world that I cannot live this life by myself. I cannot live the life that I desire to live and that God desires me to live by myself. And by remaining on the vine, we are saying that we are going to follow God's plan and his purpose and align our life with his and not our own desires or our own dreams or our own pursuits. It means Jesus is our 
God. He is our master. Remaining on the vine is in essence saying the words of John the Baptist that God must become greater and I must become less. This is a hard thing. This is the call to be a disciple. Due to this, many will run away. Many will not attach themselves to the vine. Many will, you know, not remain attached to the vine. And due to that, they won't bear much fruit. And due to that, they will not grow in spiritual maturation or experience the glory or the joy or the peace of God. So what about you? Will you remain Will you throw aside everything else to take hold of Christ? Will you trust that he is the one who can bring you to God and not yourself? Will you admit that you're a sinner and need him in order to bring you into relationship with God? You see, God extends the offer to become a branch to all people. And I know is that we have the little ones in here today, and I keep saying branch, and they probably watched... um, Oh, what are those weird little things? Trolls, yes. And they're like, branch, branch, branch. So yeah, every time, guys, you watch trolls and you hear branch, we could all be a branch, just not with crazy hair, but connected to Jesus. Look at that Jesus juke right there. That is, that was solid. All right. Man, that was bad. It was really bad. But we can all become a branch. So he has provided a great vine in his son. And as we alluded to earlier, fables like my father. This is my father. As we alluded to earlier that God himself is the gardener. Jesus said, my father is the gardener. So what do gardeners do? Jesus said, every branch of me that does not produce fruit, he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so it will produce more fruit. So the gardener removes unfruitful branches and prunes the ones producing fruit. In regards to spiritual maturation, this means that God frees us for spiritual growth. God frees us for spiritual growth. You see, it's not healthy for a plant to have a lot of dead growth on it. The, the, the dead growth can bring disease. The dead growth can fall off and harm the fruit branches. So the gardener comes in at the right time, the right way, and removes the branches that need to be removed at a specific time. Like if, let's say you have a big tree in your yard and you go, it's time to cut that thing back. And you just go out with like some shears and you just start chopping. Like, there's actually a good time of year to do this. There's actually a right way to, to cut things and to put stuff on the area that you've, you've cut from. Google that stuff before you do it, all right? Because there's a right way, and God knows the right way. He's a master gardener. So the gardener comes at the right time, and the right way removes the unfruitful branches for the good of the, the unfruitful branches for the good of the fruitful branches. So I know that oftentimes, there's sometimes you guys may not have grown up in an agrarian society. Some of you may have always lived in more urban areas. I grew up in an agrarian society, and I grew up working in the, well, the number one legal cash crop in Kentucky is tobacco. The number one illegal cash crop is marijuana. Um, I had some family members who worked in the first. I worked in the latter. Tobacco. (laughs) We're getting all mixed up. Tobacco. All right. Rager family's infamous in Kentucky. So I worked in tobacco. And tobacco plants start off really, really small. And so you sit on the back of a tractor and you put them in this machine and it plants them. And then you don't do a whole lot with them. You may go and clean out weeds and stuff like that. But eventually, yeah, I'm short, but tobacco plants grow about this tall. And so their, their leaves start to grow out. And about halfway through the growing season, you go through and you do something called suckering. And I was like, what in the world? Somebody's like, hey, Barry, I'm going to pick you up at 7 o'clock. I'm going to go sucker some plants. And I, was, I had images running through my mind, and I was like, this isn't good. <laughs> I don't want to do anything like that to these plants. But what they're talking about is you start looking at the vine that the, the leaves are growing off of, and you have big leaves, and then you have little bitty leaves that are growing over top of those. And so what you do is you take your thumb and you break off all the little leaves, and they call them suckers because they're sucking the nourishment out from the big leaves. And so you go through and you sucker it, and that's like pruning, okay? So that you can provide more nourishment to the leaves that you want, 
to have growth and health. And then tobacco is actually a flowering plant. And the tops of tobacco will grow into beautiful blooms and flowers. And what you do then is called topping. And so you go through and you break the tops out of all the tobacco plants so that all the nourishment and the energy of the plant doesn't go to making this bloom, but that, again, the energy and the nourishment goes back into the leaves. So that's like cutting off other aspects in order to make the leaves grow. Now, as you can tell, farmers may be good at what they do, but they weren't the best at coming up with names. So suckering and topping is like pruning and cutting off. But God the Father does the exact same thing. He prunes the fruitful branches, and he cuts off the things that don't need to be there. So when Jesus speaks about God doing this, I use the word free, but the literal word means to cleanse. So the branches are cleansed by God in order to help them be more fruitful and healthy. So just like with tobacco, God will remove things that do not need to be there for the good of the branch. So we as the branches often feel like it is not for our good. We don't like things being broken off from us. We don't like things being taken away from us. We feel the pain of removal and we oftentimes don't see quick growth or a quick reason for this and we become angry at God. In Hebrews chapter 12, the author wrote, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering is discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. But he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God is a master gardener. He knows what needs to be removed from your life. He knows what's best. Sometimes it's a removal of a comfort. Sometimes it's a removal of a relationship or a job or a home even. We see this so many times in our lives, and we see this so many times in Scripture. And we can oftentimes see these things as judgment. Just like the author said here, we don't see them good at the time, but it is God's loving kindness shown to you that he takes these things that he prunes. So rather than fearing the hands of the gardener, will you trust and rejoice when you feel his touch? Don't be afraid when you see God removing something. But pray for faith to know that God is doing what is right and what is best for your good and for his glory. And the last aspect I want to focus on here is the Holy Spirit, that God the Holy Spirit is our guide for spiritual growth. Now you may think, now wait a minute, all that stuff that, that Demetrius read, I, I didn't hear anything about the, the Holy Spirit. Well, if you look down at the bottom of John chapter 15, Jesus said, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You see, the Holy Spirit is our guide for spiritual growth. How many of you all, so you may not have grown tobacco, but how many of you all have grown tomatoes? All right, got some hands now. We're, we've all read those urban gardening books. If you haven't, like I said earlier, Google it. Now, don't Google everything. Watch some things that you Google, but you can Google urban gardening and um, whatever I said to Google earlier. I don't even remember. But when you grow tomatoes, like the vine grows and the, the branches start to bear fruit, but so often the branches will become so heavy with fruit that they start to fall or that they can fail or that they can cause the entire plant to go over. And so oftentimes you will have a cage around it in order to be a support to the branches or to guide the branches. And sometimes you see this with, with grapes and like, 
a vine, and the vine grows upon a trellis, and the branches hook themselves to the trellis. So this is exactly what the Holy Spirit does with us. Jesus said that the Spirit will testify about the Father. The Spirit will bring to our minds the things of his teaching and the things that God desires us to know. In John 16, 13, Jesus, Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. He will lead you. The Spirit guides us in growth. The Holy Spirit will move in us all as believers. But he does so differently. And this is important for us to hear. And it's kind of weird, but it does so differently. Paul wrote, By the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. You see, so often we can look at our spiritual growth and we can look at the spiritual growth of someone else. And we can see that we are spiritually this tall, but we look at them and we go, well, they're spiritually this tall. I'm, I'm doing hype because it's a way I compare myself to other people. It's very discouraging, very discouraging. But, but we oftentimes will compare ourselves to other people in regards to spiritual growth, but we are not supposed to be folks who do that. Every one of us have been given a different measure of faith. Every one of us has been given a different measure of faith. And Instead of evaluating other people's spiritual growth and maturation, our first priority is to evaluate our spiritual growth and maturation. Not to talk about how the Spirit should guide them, but to seek God and ask how the Spirit is guiding us. You see, we need to seek to be faithful to the measure of the Spirit that God has given us. So as we grow and as we mature and as we exercise the freedom that God the Father prunes to give us in our growth, We do so by the guidance of the Spirit. You see, there are things given to us in Scripture, things that we should do, things that we should not do, but not everything that we can do in our lives is given to us in Scripture. The Bible didn't talk about face page. Face page, Facebook. Gosh. (laughs) Facebook or, or Twitter. All right, the Bible didn't talk about when you use your 140 characters, do so in this way. Jesus didn't tell us to, hey, guys, listen, whenever somebody sends you that link and says, if you actually love me, share that to 10 people, you need to do that. He, he didn't say that. Because there are things that we will go through in our lives that were not mentioned in the Bible. And so we have to be people who follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have to be people to, who understand that, that the Spirit can speak to us by our conscience. What does our conscience desire us to do? What does our conscience allow us to do? So in the book of Romans, chapter 14, Paul wrote this. He said, one person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day, observe it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. Whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat, so he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ both died, Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be the Lord over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This means, again, that we need to focus on the guidance of the Spirit. We need to learn to hear his voice. So what is the Spirit calling you to do? How is the Spirit leading you? What is the Spirit convicting you of? How is he speaking to your conscience on a matter? You see, it is a very true thing this morning, these words. It is a sin for some of you to drink alcohol. But it's not a sin for all of you to drink alcohol. There's going to be people watching and going, oh my gosh, just got in trouble by some people, all right? There, it is a sin for some of you to eat specific foods. And it's not a sin for some of you to eat specific foods. And what I'm saying in this is that God is not a moral relativist. God is not saying, hey, you do your thing and you live your truth. All right, God is the truth. 
And that is the only truth we are to live according to. But how is he leading you to live? How is he leading you to live in holiness and to focus on him and to do his will? It doesn't matter if all these other folks are doing it. If God's not allowing you to do it, then you don't do it. And it doesn't matter if God is saying to all these folks, hey, don't do this, and he's leading you to do it, then you need to do it. Search the word. Talk to other people. Get feedback from, from his, your faith family. But at the end of the day, the guidance of the Spirit is our guide for growth. And we need to learn to listen to the Spirit. We need to seek to be mature and seek to bear good fruit. And that comes to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus' encouragement to all is to come and to be a part of the glorious kingdom and the thing that he is building on this earth, to be a part of this planting of the Lord. He says in John 15, 4, remain in me and I in you. This literally means abide in Christ. Abide. And as we abide in Christ, we bear fruit, which means we mature. And our maturation is for God's glory, the advance of the kingdom, and our joy. So hear this, our maturation, our growth in Christ is for God's glory, the advance of the kingdom, and our joy. Jesus said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove yourselves to be my disciples. You see, as we grow in Christ, it is like a light bursting forth in the dark. It can't be denied. It can't be looked away from. It is powerful. God's glory bursts forth through our lives. Jesus said we prove ourselves to be his disciples, advancing the kingdom. We take the gospel with us. We serve and love and speak and conduct ourselves in a life aligned with Jesus' life. And this growth brings us joy. Jesus said in verse 11, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be be complete. The more we become like Christ, the more we experience his joy, the more we experience his peace. So if you're not yet a believer, come to him today. If you are a believer, remain in him, knowing that Jesus indwelling makes abiding and obedience possible. Trust him. Don't fear the hand of the farmer, but find his cleansing hand good and follow the guidance of the spirit, bearing fruit for the glory of God, the advancement of the kingdom and for your joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the goodness of your word, for the truth that you give us and God, for all the amazing ways that you speak to us. Guide us in the ways we need to be guided. Prune us in the ways we need to be pruned. God, when it's hard for us to remain, give us strength to remain. Thank you that you remain, that you are faithful, that you do the good work of, of pruning us and cutting off what doesn't need to be there. And thank you, Father, that you speak to us in every situation, in every circumstance. Father, you are never far from your children. And Lord, I pray to for the one who does not yet follow you. God, that today you would awaken faith in their hearts, that you would open their eyes, and that they would see Jesus, that they would see that they need, need you for their life, that they would not desire to live a life aligned with themselves, but they would desire to live a life aligned with you. Father, you are good and your love endures forever. Thank you for the grace and the mercy that you've shown us ultimately that you displayed by Jesus on the cross. God, may we remember him and celebrate him today in Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus, as the true vine, gave his life so that we could all know God so that we could all have a relationship with God. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross, shedding his blood, having his body broken. And today, if you're a believer, we invite you to take a communion. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, after supper and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So for the bread, this is the body of Christ broken for you. For the juice, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance of Christ. Remember that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is filled on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. trust the sweetest frame I only trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone quick made strong in the Savior's love through the trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne he's Christ alone Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's lift it up. Christ alone.
you guys for being with us today. Um, appreciate everybody being here both with us physically and with us via the live stream. Um, if you're new here this morning, we're so glad that you're here and uh, we would love to get to know you. Um, if you're here physically with us, we're going to have newcomers often in, um, in the courtyard following gathering. You'll get pastor in there and we would love to uh, meet you, hear a little bit of your story and share a little bit of ours. Um, if you are with us online, you can connect with us through our website or through our app, and we would love to get with you that way. Um, a couple things we've got coming up this week. I uh, want to remind you all, uh, you can send us prayer requests through our app. If you don't have it, you can download it at your app, at your app store. You can also give through that, so we encourage you to take advantage of that as well. Uh, New Circle Kids class-specific Zoom calls have started. So uh, if you need more info on that, you can uh, take a look at our website or connect with one of us, and we would love to connect you. I think that first week was a big success. The kids really enjoyed that time, so we're thankful to be able to do that. This week, triads begin. Um, if you are already in a triad, we are so excited to see how God's going to use that. If you're not yet, uh, you can, again, on our website, connect through. Um, there's a type form if you don't have a tribe but you want to be a part of one, you can fill that out and we will connect you. Um, or if you have a triad, please go on there and just let us know so that we know kind of who's connected and who still needs to be connected. And then next week uh, is New Circle's birthday celebration. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, coffee and cupcakes outside. Uh, one thing we're doing, and we really want to encourage you to be a part of this, is if you have a picture or can record a short video, send that in to us, um, basically kind of describing you know, how New Circle has blessed you or an encouragement about New Circle. We want to put that together into a video collage, and so we would encourage you. We need these in by the 8th. So please submit those. You can send them to info at newcirclechurch.com. But please be a part of that as we celebrate another year with God being so faithful. Um, in a weird uh, year, in some strange circumstances, he continues to show himself so faithful. So we want to celebrate that. Um, and then in October, uh, we'll be doing four weeks in uh, First Peter. Christopher's going to be doing that Bible study so we can get with him. That's going to be Saturdays at 8 a.m. in the sanctuary. So please plan to be a part of that. And now we ask you to stand with us as we sing one more song together. So I'm going to ask that we just sing this chorus out. I know we're a bit muffled this morning, but I just ask that you sing this out to the Lord with us. It's your bread in our lives. So we pour out. Pour out a praise, it's your bread in our lives. So we pour out a praise to you. Lord. One more time. It's your bread. Oh, 
purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. 